Hello and welcome to the Devoted Outdoorsman's Podcast. Hello, Podcast Nation. Uh, This week on the podcast, we have an amazing guest. His name is Jesse Moorhead, and you guys may have heard of him. He has been in the hunting industry for a long time, and he is what some would call a legend in the hunting industry. So today, we're going to talk a little bit about how he got introduced into the outdoors, and we'll see where this conversation goes. So Jesse, how did you get introduced into the outdoors? Well, let me say the, in the beginning of this, you may hear a dog bark or something like that or anything else because I'm out here on my porch just watching grass grow. But uh, it, it happened many years ago, 46 years ago, 47 years ago. This guy come from uh, my neighbor came over and he said, Jesse, do you want to go on a bow hunt? I said, listen, I've never been on a bow hunt in my life. I, I don't even know. We didn't even have deer where I was at in extreme North Georgia. He said, I'll take you. I'll show you how to do it this evening. <laughs> I said, this evening? I said, good. I like just right off the bat like that. So we went to South Georgia, uh, and then he handed me a recurve. I practiced on a bale, got to where I could shoot it in that pie plate, luckily about 15 yards or so. And I, I just enjoyed it right off the bat. I went out there and stuck my, tip of my bow into the ground. While I was sitting down, this little deer come up. I drawed it back, my tip still in the ground, and shot an arrow about two feet in front of me. I've been in love ever since. So it's just through a neighbor that said, you want to go bow hunting? I said, sure. So, I, you know, I took it to the next level and, and uh, been doing it ever since. So uh, do you remember what bow was your first actual bow that you, like, uh, either saved up for or kind of, like, went and actually purchased out of the store? Yeah, you know, he he handed me a little browning, I forget what they were called, a little browning, maybe a Nomad recurve, and uh, I think it was uh, probably, I'm, I'm going to say about a 69 mile, somewhere right along in there, and uh, so then I, when I missed that deer at that range and I heard that little rascal snort at me, I was hooked, so I went, and not only hooked, I was hooked, I was wanting to go shoot some competition because I'd heard about it, so I went to a Tasco store used to be called, and I bought a Golden Indian Trophy Comanche. It was it was a solid cable bow. They wasn't a string on it. It was cables on cables. The string was a cable, and uh, I thought I was I thought that was the best made, you know. So I went to this tournament, this local tournament, and they had all these fancy bows and put mine to shame. But I was still a young man. I was all ready to go. So I looked at the board after I got done, and I was next to life, and that hooked me forever because I said, look, I beat one of them. I think if I practice a lot, I can get a few more. (laughs) So that's where it all took off from, and then the hunting, it was just at the same time, and I was with a bow 24. I mean, it was just ridiculous at the hours I spent shooting a bow. My goal was to be a world champion right off the bat, and I, it, uh, that's where it all took off from. And uh, you continued to shoot uh, competitive archery for a, a long time. Oh, I still do. I, I, I just laid off the last year or so, but I shot 46 years straight, um, 38 years as a pro, and then the early years, you know, as a uh, uh, bow hunter, excuse me, bear bow, bow hunter class, and I shot everything from field archery to distance archery to every, about every phase of archery you can imagine. And then I set some new goals. I wanted, you know, uh, I wanted to be world champ. With, I didn't think of myself being greedy, but I wanted to be a world champion in each one of those. <laughs> so I worked, I worked pretty hard at it and, and uh, uh, achieved my goals that I had. And and then along the way, I did uh, the rifle world championship. And and so I've been involved either as a dealer, a brief dealer. Uh, an inventor, you know, making some archer products were sold on the market for years, and uh, and the competitive side of it, um, the industry from head to toe, um, I've been involved in for all these years, and I I thank the good Lord for it because I've met so many people um, that it's amazing they just become part of the family. So it's something you never get out of. It's something you might go away from for a year. But you never get out of it because they're still on the phone. Uh, friends that you've met 
during the whole time. So it's a, it's a lifelong experience for me. It's, it has been, and I'll continue to do it. I'm not digging in trying to be a, a, a world champion again. Uh, but when I shoot, I really enjoy it now, uh, probably as much as I ever have, as far as just shooting and out here in the backyard with ginger or something like that, I really enjoy it. So after your first uh, hunting experience you went on with your bow, how long was it from then until you actually harvested a deer? Well, it's uh, it was the very next year a friend of mine, Mitch Phillips out of Georgia, invited me on a hunt. And um, I just won the world. Let's see. No, it's two years later. Two years later, uh, the next year I shot a deer. I'm saying I'm wanting to say it's like seventy, seventy four, seventy five. I shot a deer because you couldn't hunt with you couldn't hunt with a bow in Georgia with a compound bow and uh, till after seventy seven. So um, so anyway, I, it, it ended up being when. I flew around there for a couple of years, and, and I shot a deer with my gun, and I really enjoyed it. And uh, and uh, and then uh, Mitch took took me under. He said, "Let's go bow hunting over here on a piece of property." I didn't have anywhere to hunt. I went over and I shot a doe, and I'm telling you, it's, it, that's where it really it really really got excited to me. And uh, about that time, I'd won my first world championship. Uh, in the Barbo Bow Hunter class, and I was fired up, and I just never slowed down, never. And uh, you hold a few. Uh, I want to. I want to say it was a world record, right? With like a, the longest uh, distance shot with a broadhead or something like that. Well, there's 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 several there's several events. You got to understand, it wasn't because I was that good; it's because I did it so long. But the uh, I, I think it's like. Uh, Eleven or twelve world championships with a bow and one with a rifle. But what's unique about the, those clients is I won with my fingers and sights, uh, release aid and sights, uh, indoors 3Ds, outdoors 3Ds, uh, field archery, and world championship in the distance archery that you're referring to. And what that was, and uh, uh, what that was is, uh, I don't know if they still do it or not, but they used to have a distance championship out in Utah in the Salt Flats. And this guy called me and he said, Jesse, I want you to go out there and see if you can get my world record back. This guy was like a professor. His name was Harry Drake. He's famous at Browning Archery. And, uh, he called me and said, I heard you can draw a heavy bow. So long story short, shortened that up. I, went and drew his bow and I went out to the salt flats of Utah and I got blessed to, to shoot a, an air for the world record. It took me a little bit to do it, but it's at the time it's 742 yards, two feet and two inches because they deduct you on windage. And uh, at the time it set the world record and uh old professor uh, gave me my $5,000 and I was just tickled to death and and I went back the next year and won it, but I didn't set the world record again. And then later, uh, a young man that actually invented Botech, or, or one of the ones that invented Botech, uh, he, uh, he he called me and told me he broke my record, and uh, and I was proud of him. He's a good he's a good boy. But uh, yeah, that's uh, and then in, in a few records I have it, you know, like state records and stuff like that. They they're still in existence, but. Hey, like I said, you know, if you poke at it long enough, you don't have to be good. You just wear everybody down where they just give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> so did you say 700 yards? 742 yards, 2 feet and 2 inches is what the Guinness Book World Record said. How big was the target? Well, you, the world. What you do is uh, you're shooting over a flag. And the closest uh, windage and the furthest, that's what it adds up. Like in other words, if you shoot at 800 yards and you're 22 feet to the right of your line, then they deduct the 22 feet back, best I remember, and that's what yardage you actually shot the air. So you got to, in the wind, you'd have to hold the bow 45 degrees and 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 sometimes 46 degrees or 44 degrees 
And, you, and that's just guesstimation, too. There wasn't really anything to get it right on. But uh, uh, at the time, I told him, I said, I set three world records. I said, the hardest a person's ever been hit by a bowstring on his arm, that was one of them. <laughs> and then another one, <laughs> a mule deer that I shot, and then the other one was that world record. But really, the the world record, I set it 90, and it went 92 against with the record. So what poundage was the bow that you were drawing at that point in time, do you know? We ranged from uh, 144 to 188. Um, real, These are real tough bows, too. They're not... Uh, they're not like a round wheel bow. They, they're about 40 pounds to me. They're about 40 pounds harder to draw than, uh, than a regular compound. They're ridiculous. They're hard on you. But, uh, the, and the reason they varied so much is like a guy named Roy Rogers had one for Hoyt, great guy. And they had a, like a, uh, eight inch brace height, a 90, 90 inch brace height. So it was easier to draw. So on 188, it drew as, as easy as one of mine did at 155, 153, 155. And, uh, you hear me telling my dog get back here. But, uh, the, um, 188, to answer your question, 188 is the most we had to shoot. I had actually had to jack the bow down to, uh, 147 or something like that to set the record because I was overspining the air. And, uh, it wasn't quite going as far as I wanted, so I just kept tuning it so I could hear it and then, and that's when it said it. That's and that's like shooting a 375 grain air. Yeah. <laughs> it's shooting a 375 grain air with a 100 grain broadhead. That's what it's called, a broadhead flat. And, uh, four, four flat stairs. And, um, uh, just for mainly for giving a little more front of center in the back. Uh, just more weight in the back. But, uh, um, the, uh, it is a long way. He had to go, we went and pulled the airs on a little three wheeler, or a little, uh, Moped thing, but uh, it was a blessing. It was fun. I I did it for a couple of years, and I I just got out of doing that. But uh, I really enjoyed it. There's a big story behind that, but it's uh, to t- to tell you later. It was a the whole trip was uh, amazing. I I got caught up in a bunch of stuff, but uh, that that's for another day. I may tell you over a campfire or something. <laughs> <laughs> so. How did you kind of like? Okay, so you 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 got introduced into uh, archery hunting. You uh, harvested your first deer, and you started shooting the tournaments and everything like that. And then is that kind of how you got introduced into the hunting industry, or did somebody approach you, or kinda, how did that happen? Well, you know, in the beginning, the archery industry that's like the shot show and stuff like that. These shows are small. The archery part of them was small. The inventions were small. They weren't very many of, you know, they weren't any camouflages. Uh, uh, Jim Crumley finally made the first camouflage to honey and that kind of stuff. And then later on in the 80s, Realtree and also Oak and different ones started popping up. But you got to remember back then, they weren't that many archer products. I invented a, what they call the Eliminator Pendulum site, uh, back in, uh, around 1980. I put it on the market and it, it was, it was the number one pendulum site for years. Uh, it was a neat site. It actually calibrated your distance for you. It has a floating little red light uh, with a crosshair in it, and wherever that floated to uh, out of a tree stand, uh, from zero out to about 35 yards, it hit dead on everything. And uh, you didn't have to judge your distance. So it was, it was pretty awesome. But the industry was small, and after I won um, the world championship, you know, people – there's, I, I was approached by different people, and and immediately because it's so small, I got to know most of, most of the people and most of the companies. You know, uh, become close to a friend like Jim Easton and and Matt, and so on and so on. Just a whole bunch of great people. So that's pretty much. Even when we did our TV show, we didn't have a hard time in the beginning getting sponsored and kind of. of <laughs> my whole family out there really of all these companies so um, that's where it came from is, is, is I got competitive and I, and I showed up at the national field championships and I got, before 3D started and uh, and then uh, everything started blossoming you know and people started making a lot of different products so do you have uh, a favorite uh, animal that you like to hunt in North America 
That's the white tailed deer for sure. It's uh the bugling and screaming elk in a certain time of the year are probably more fun to hunt. But as far as the harvest goes, the the big giant white tailed bucks is, is what I live for. It's just um they just ding my bell, you know, but uh uh, and it used to be, there's a difference. Uh, like, I, I started trophy hunting, seriously trophy hunting, several years ago. And so I get to see a whole lot more deer. I don't shoot the first deer and stuff. And uh, don't get me wrong now, the redneck side of me wants to every single time because I love eating them and I love harvesting them. And I, I, you know, I just, uh, but I forced myself into trophy hunting, which now I see a whole lot more deer. I see a lot of great bucks. And then uh, when that old rascal comes that I want, then uh, then I harvest it. And I got a real bad habit of hunting one deer. Or uh, I'm trying to break that because <laughs> those can get real long. But uh, it, it feels good when you finally get it done. Yeah, I understand that when that one buck kind of just like gets gets there, gets to you, you know, keeps poking you, like oh, you know, gets on a good pattern to a trail camera, and then. Uh, changes it up to go somewhere else and you know once you think you got them figured it figured out you know you 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 learned that you didn't have it figured out at all i got a buck oh, like that <laughs> yeah I, and i've got uh there's so many stories i can say i'll, I'll share them with you one day right when we get um get some time to do it but there's so many stories about bucks like that and encounters matter of fact i'm just now i've been writing it now for the last several months but I just do a little bit of time, and I'm writing a little book that uh, that that takes a deer from the time it opens its eyes in Kansas, because there's a spot there that I hunted around the lakes and different places. It time it opens its eyes, it tells the story of itself, everything from friends he makes all the way through his life to uh, learning about hunters, pressures, learning about where to go when you're. You know, getting real sharp and, and, and learning how to go toward the noise, uh, being the safest place to go and so on and so on and so on. But, uh, I really enjoyed writing. It really makes me think about, uh, uh, all the things that I learned through the years. And, and, and Michael Jordan said one time, the reason he got good is because of all the mistakes he made. So that's why I'm a decent because I've made just tons of mistakes and, uh, woods and trying to figure out deer but i figured out about 95 percent of the hunters hunt the same way and that's not the way you want to hunt if you're going to kill your real big deer but um but it's uh it's been interesting i i really take it i can't wait to go to kansas and i'm opening it up in kentucky this year opening day i normally don't hunt until uh, last of october but i'm gonna go with bill roberts up there and Kentucky opening days, good and hot, but about three days in the Kentucky season, the first three days are real good hunts, and then it gets a little chaos until the end of October, but I'm looking forward to it and heading to Kansas. Yeah, and uh, one of the things about Kentucky is uh, they open up with like September 15th or something like that, so you can uh, you can harvest a velvet buck in Kentucky. Yeah, that's and they've got a season this year. Uh, I'm thinking Bill told me to come on September 1st. Uh, They've got, a, I think it's September 1st. I'm not sure, but uh, I need to find out because I'd hate to go up there and not. Of course, I'd just go fishing if I went up there and couldn't hunt. But uh, it's, uh, I think it is around September 1st. I, mean, I could be wrong. I, I I don't know. I haven't looked into Kentucky. I know, uh, I think it's Tennessee. They have a special season this year that uh, it's like a three-day little special hunt in August that they're having. So I thought that was kind of cool. There's a bunch of states doing interesting little hunts like that. Yeah, they don't have to worry about losing many bucks during that time. <laughs> they they might, if they get in there and get on some uh, short soybeans and stuff like that, some fresh soybeans, they may kill some good deer in them three days. But, uh, golly, bum, that's going to be some hot hunt. That's going to be a flipping 100 degrees. Yeah, wearing, wearing a swimsuit in your deer stand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I killed a deer one time. I was working at a hill spot. I took off and it was about 97 degrees in Georgia. And I didn't have about, oh, I had 15, 20 minutes to hunt. I had 20 minutes to drive. So it was one of the things. I went in and climbed up the tree and I had a hill spot towel with me, a white hill spot towel. I dried the sweat off of me. Look down, here comes a big old nanny doe, and I shoot it, and I'm headed out of the woods. It was one of those crazy, awesome evenings. But, um, 
And that and that 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 determines your hunt. It doesn't matter if you decide to shoot something. If it's me, if I decide to shoot something, I don't care how big it is. I'm nervous. I'm nervous. I don't care if I'm shooting a doe, uh, anything else I'm shooting. I am not nervous. I'm not telling you on a 200 inch deer. I'm not a little more nervous, but uh, of course I am. But I'm nervous on anything that I go to shoot. So I've, I've uh, the big does I've taken and stuff like that through the years. I used to uh, shoot a bunch of does and and I had a big family and it was awesome. And ginger now then ginger. She'll straighten me up. She said, listen, you want to shoot me two or three does wherever you're at where we can have some meat in the freezer. So uh, I don't mind obliging her. <laughs> uh, I think I was watching a hunt was it, a couple days ago. I was looking around some videos. I was online. You know, it's kind of taking me back to when I was a kid because I used to watch you on TV when I was a kid. And, uh, you know, it was, it was crazy. When uh, old Hoss, you know, he kind of talked to me. He said, "Hey, man," he said he'd be interested in your podcast. And I was like, "No way!" Like, really? And, you know, that's like you know, it would be a dream. When I was a little kid, you know, I used to watch you on TV all the time. But uh, the other day, I was looking through. I think it was on YouTube or something like that. I saw a hunt of where you actually used a muzzleloader to kill a, a harvest of buck. Oh man! And Rob, I, I'm glad I had it because what had happened there? I was in Illinois, and uh, I. My camera guy, I'd shot a, a really nice eight point buck, tall eye guard, real gnarly, stuff like that. I'd shot it with my bow and come to find out my camera guy didn't match record. So I, I was, I was in, in hunting up there, I was wanting to make sure that, uh, uh, that I got, I was hunting on this, uh, the later would be called, uh, the Grigsby. And, uh, I wanted to go back and, uh, I was hunting on Dick McCormick's farm, and I wanted to give them exposure. So I went to Game Fish and come to find out, you know, uh, residents get a, a two buck tags up there, and I and they gave me a governor. I think it was called a governor's tag. I they didn't give it to me. I bought it. I purchased another tag, and then because of, uh, Daryl Westerman out of Illinois says, "Listen, Jess, I'm gonna I loan you my muzzle loader. Season's coming up here in a couple of days, and see if you can get one with it." And honestly, I took his muzzle loader and I went to a place I've never been before. And uh, uh, the guy set me in the woods a couple of days. Uh, uh, and I go, this was on uh, Dick McCormick's, one of his farms also. And the deer that never been seen, as far as anybody knows, on his property. They they got pictures of it three miles away on the Salt Lake uh, earlier in the season. I found out later. Well, was in his woods at another farm for two days and I finally told the young man I said listen he's a great young man I, I told him I go listen the deer's on food so if you got food I need to go hunt them food source and uh, he said well they wasn't like seven days ago I said doesn't matter I said doesn't matter what they're on three days ago after the snow and it's cold weather they're on food and so we went to the we went he said I know where there's a cut corn field with alfalfa mixing into the corn I go, my, my, my. I said, you just call the right shots on that one. And I got over there and they had paw places out in the snow where they'd been trying to get to the alfalfa and the corn. And, and then the video pretty much tells the rest of it. But most, what most people seen that, that video was shot probably more than any, or showed more than probably any other hunt. Um, but it's a uh, ginger was filming that hunt. She had two cameras in the tree, no tripod. And I mean, no a tree arm or anything. She had two cameras in a tree, and she hand filmed that. And reach had two cameras is because one of them had a real good zoom, and one of them showed uh, footage that was late better. So uh, uh, she filmed that deer with two cameras when it first come out well over there about 400 yards. And I told her I just I couldn't hardly speak. And I told her I said I said that's 200 inch deer, Ginger. And uh, so when it come out, it Turn sideways, and then the rest is what you're seeing on the show where it comes in there about 150 yards, and finally I go ahead and shoot it. But, man, uh, I was just going over there. Dick thought there's some deer where uh, a 10-pointer might go close to 150, and I was really going over there to hunt that deer. And some, like sometimes they do, these giant deer show up in places for whatever reason, and and uh, I got blessed. Uh, 
I got really blessed with that one. That's a that's one of my finer deer. And uh, what did that buck end up scoring? One ninety eight and seven eighths on the on the one ninety eight yeah one ninety eight and seven eighths. That's a giant. So it, that's crazy. Yeah, it had <laughs> it had about nine inches of broken tine too. So he was a solid into the two low twos. That's gross. And uh, uh, I always say nets for fish, so I don't ever net them much, but. That was the second largest deer. I'd, large one was a Kansas buck. I'd rattle in shot, but it's that was a good one. And uh, but that was the only deer that I that I shot. The only buck that I shot with a anything but a bow. It was 17 years up before that, and it's been since then. So, and I and I'm one of these that love. I absolutely love to shoot uh, rifles. I always have. That's under that rifle competition, that world championship down there, and I just loved it because uh, it's no different to me than archery. It's still keeping a cool head and squeezing the trigger. And, and I know a lot of archers, they just, boy, just slam the gun on and stuff. But not me. I don't do it, you know, one time out of hundreds of times. But, uh, but I've always been sponsored and always been around the, the archery world so much that I very seldom jump out of it. Uh, uh, the only reason I was at the Rifle World Championship because there's a combination of archery and rifle shooting and pistol shooting, so I entered I entered all three of them. <laughs> well, you did pretty good in that one. Well, I got lucky. I, I won that World Championship with that rifle, and it just has a whole funny story behind that. But I say I'll, I'll share that with you later. But they didn't know who I was. I knew who I knew who I was from archery, and uh, and I knew some of them from. There's world champion rifle shooters and pistol shooting Mikey Sleevey and some more. So anyway, there's so many stories and so many things that, uh, uh, like I say, I'll share with you. And, and I don't mind um, if you uh, run out of people to do the podcast one day and you call me. I don't mind telling you a story on the, the people. If it won't bore people too bad to listen to a deer story. <laughs> No, man, that's what it's all about. It's about deer stories. I mean, a lot of the people I have on here, that's all we talk about is just how they harvested the deer. Uh, one of the guys I had on in uh, January, Larry Wheeler, from here, he's here from here locally in Oklahoma, and he harvested two 200-inch deer this year out of the same tree within 10 days of each other. And uh, I just I just knew that that one had to be I it was just a once in a lifetime I had to talk to him had to talk to him about it and uh, he had no idea that those deer were there. Well, that's where it shows up. You get a pair of deer, a pair of brothers, or something they grow up in a particular deer with an old doe, and it and it and it's the kind of deer too, Rob, that that'll live behind a house, uh, fifty foot from the house most of their lives, or or right against a road, or right against cons- cons- construction. And those deer grow up. They'll stay there for them five or six years. And then all of a sudden, some, they get busted out of there or something and somebody shoots one of them. That's where you get you, that's where you get your giant deer. Because, uh, from my experience, when, uh, pressure gets on, the deer go closer to the noise. Cause they know for a fact they ain't gonna be no, uh, deer hunter with, with any threat that's got a lot of, making a lot of noise in the woods. It's just, it's, you know, it's just, uh, ain't gonna happen. When the hunters start in, they're quiet, and uh, they one thing sounds like a hunter, and that's a hunter. And uh, the uh, so deers learn that they learn it after about three or four years, and they get up around that five six year mark. Uh, for for a good example, I was hunting a deer in Kansas right there, uh, and I was about eighty yards from the road, a dirt road where they was building a bridge. And I was, and the reason I didn't kill him, he was 206, uh, a guy killing on down the river. The reason I didn't kill that deer is on kind of, I was 80 yards from that road and I should have been 30. I should have been right there watching them guys pound that. I could see their eyebrows and I could have killed that deer. He, he was just cutting me short on a pinch point there, but just out of sight because it got thick right there and I didn't realize it until later. And, uh, he had it just wore out trees big as mine thighs and everything else right in front of me and during that time of year i'd done done all my scouting so i wasn't going to walk through the woods and find out and and and, and leave just a hint of scent for him to pick up and leave i just miscalled that one i miscalled him and uh and it cost me that buck but anyway another guy killed it he's absolutely totally excited so that's fine with me 
Yeah, I bet that one gets under your skin having a 200 incher just kind of, you know, n- not not necessarily outsmart you, but uh, you know, he had a little loophole, found a little little hole to get through. Oh, he would come and stand. I found a place where he would come and stand on the creek on this little hump of sand that's about a a 10 foot uh, circle. And every tree in that little ten foot circle was almost absolutely worn in two, and tons and tons of tracks to where he just paced in that little circle. And that reason I found out that he did that, that's the only place that he could see up toward the road that he could see everything moving. If there's a doe comes through, he would see it. If there's a buck and doe come through, he would see it. And he stayed there, and that's how he did his deal he wouldn't leave until he seen the doe uh and and then he had another place when that doe came by he would go to it i thought it was sharp as tack i thought the old boy was just plumb sharp but uh so now you're working for, with uh hunter safety systems how did you kind of end up there well i invented this uh, me and a friend of mine has this floating miniature football helmet uh you can look it up it's on uh, it's on uh just just look up uh well hunter safety system there's the same companies on it uh but the football helmet uh when I sold it to them they put it under an, another another name and then it used to be called levitating sports when I had it before and then hunter safety system actually bought the rights to it and then I, so I told them part of the deal was is I come to work there with them uh uh sorta and uh and uh have insurance and and see if I can help them out on some things and so that's what I've been doing. I've been in there building and invented several little products and different things and and even a couple of fishing products that's gonna come out later under another name. But uh but you can look at that hoverhelmets dot com and you'll uh it'll pull that helmet up. But the uh that's how that's how I got with them, and then uh, I they'd always sponsored us, and always been I always thought the world of them, some of the best people on the planet, and it was owned by two brothers and a, a best friend, and uh, Jim Barter he got out of it, retired, and then John and Jerry, and they still own it, and uh, just some of the finest people you've ever met, and and so conscious of. Safety, it's crazy. It's They've done an excellent job on all that stuff. Yeah, and I think that especially this time of year when everyone's going out and getting their stand set up or even starting to hunt in certain areas here in the next, you know, month or so, that the hunter safety system is something that everyone should try to have out there with them or, you know, something similar. That way that that'll keep them harnessed in the tree because every year at this time of year, we start seeing people that, you know, accidentally slip and fall or whatever that may be. And, you know, I think everyone's attitude towards it is, oh, it won't happen to me. And, uh, you know, then it does. Oh, my goodness, Rob. I'm glad you brought that up because that's the most important thing is coming back to your family. And um, I tell you, there's a lot of things out there that, that will protect you. But I want people to keep in mind that, and matter of fact, I'm just retiring from Hunter Safety, just retiring period on most things. And I, but still, and then I'll do this to the day I die. Uh, Hunter Safety System, that's, that's all they do. That's what they do is they created that system in every way that they can that they've been through. I told you there'd be trucks coming by. Um, Everything that they do is based around safety. And I'm going to tell you the key to this. They've got the finest vest that you can put on. They've got a new Pro Series that's phenomenal. And so you even got a port on it you can charge your cell phone. So it's, uh, it's phenomenal equipment. But one thing they do that stands out more than anything to me is they take and, and Test it to the not one, not twice as much as it needs, but five to six times more than it needs, uh, and even more. Uh, like the lifeline, it, 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 to me, it's it's as important as your vest, because most of the people fall climbing into the up the tree, into the stand, or getting out of stand, climbing down. That's where most of the falls come from. And the lifeline, when you hook it up in your tree, all you do is walk up and hook hook to it. 
and you never unhook the whole time that you're hunting and coming back down and going up. So that would eliminate deaths from a tree stand totally if people just used Lifeline. And people call me all the time, they'll they'll be making them one. I said, what kind of rope do you use in this stuff? And they'll have stuff that, of course, is strong. They say, well, 800 pounds. Well, it don't need to be 800. It needs to be about four to 5,000 pounds on account of snatch weight and uh, distance you fall and so on and so on. And I said, how much does the sun eat it up? People need to un- understand that there's certain materials that even though it pull, may pull 2,000 pounds, let the sun shine on it for a year and it might pull 250 pounds. So, uh, but they went through all that testing and they built the finest equipment. But I want to stress the lifeline uh, because, uh, like I said, eight, I think it's 87% fall going up, getting in the stand or getting out of the stand and coming back down. They've been people found dead under their tree stand with, with hunter safety systems on because they, they stepped over it and didn't hook it up. Uh, I know Bill Jordan's, uh, Mike McKenzie, I think it was Mike, and we, he, he fell out and killed himself and had his vest on. And then I had some friends of mine, Bill had his vest on and so on and so on. But if you could see all the letters that come in the hunter safety system to where people have fallen and they're paralyzed or, or a family member, they, they fall and they died. And now we're getting 85, 90% of those, even probably more than that. Is all going, hey, you saved my dad's life. You saved my husband's life. Um, he's a little scratched up, but you saved his life. And, uh, and it's such a blessing when that comes in. I know Mr. Jerry and John grin from ear to ear, and so do I and the rest of them. Um, and it's, uh, it's so important. And they are. They are. And, and, and I want uh, people like yourself and Hoss and the rest of everybody stress so much because many people as they can about being safe and coming back. And these tough guys that think they're tough enough to survive it, well, I'm telling you, I'm telling you right now, I know some guys that did not come fight a chainsaw and uh, they're paralyzed in a wheelchair. And one of them's already dead. So I counted, I don't know how many of my friends over the last two years, uh, pretty close friends, has fallen and the lifeline has caught them. And a couple of them had failed. One of them died, and one of them's paralyzed, and another one's, uh, he's back on his feet now, and another's back on his feet now. But that's just in the people that's close to me. So now anybody that knows me, they're going to have to hear that old story about the lifeline every time because um, we need to preach it and preach it and preach it that you got you need that hookup. But don't get up there and hook a rope around you. You're going to live about 30 seconds. And don't, don't, uh, those old wrapped around things, uh, 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 I don't even know what you call them. They just wrap around your waist with a little carabiner like thing on them and you fall. Well, you might have, might have two or three minutes before you die. It's going to break your back most likely anyway. So just keep that in mind. I, I know I went on and on about that, but you hit a subject right there that's pretty, pretty important to me because I see it and I, and I see these guys that, Never had fallen before. Now they're getting them. Uh, they've been busted up, and now they're going, they got back on their feet, and they want to go to the woods, and they want to know uh, about the lifeline. Bill Roberts, a good friend of mine, one I studied about him going to Kentucky with, failed this last season, opening day in Kansas, and thought for sure he was dead. I mean, punched his lungs, did everything. I mean, I don't know how many different things. He stayed down for months, and. Uh, now he's ready to, he's ready to, he's ready to hunt again. He's ready to go, but he wanted lifelines in every tree that he had anywhere that he's ever, ever going to hunt. And if he just did that ahead of time, it wouldn't ever happen. But like you said, it ain't gonna happen to me. And that's what a lot of people think. I do believe, you know. And I think that has a lot to do with us being guys a lot of times, you know. And uh, yeah. you know, guys are always like that. Like you said, you know, some of them are tough enough to fight a chainsaw, but you know, that's what they think. Oh, uh, it won't happen to me. I won't slip. And you know, I got I caught myself doing a similar, you know, same thing a few years ago. I was in a climber, you know, actually in a climbing stand, and uh, I, uh, you know, it was the middle of the day. I'd been all, all day sitting. I kind of nodded off a little bit, and I didn't fall, but I slipped. 
And uh, that's that's when I uh, decided to change everything up a little bit. And uh, I've been working on getting everybody and everything set up with uh, systems. <coughs> but, uh, oh, yeah. And like gender, said, it saved gender twice. See, right there. You know, saved her twice. Yeah. One and, of them you know, was uh, she shot a muzzleloader. She was 45 foot in a stand, which I never would get 45 foot. You couldn't make me get 45 foot. I'm a low hunter. I'm lower to the ground later in the season. But she was about 45 foot in a stand, shot a muzzleloader. And she was on her way out, on her safety system, caught her. And another time she had was filming me and run the camera around the tree to film the buck running off and fell out, grabbed me on the elbow, and the hunter safety system caught her. That's two times with my wife. Uh, my butts are puckered in the tree stand. I'm, 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 I'm so careful, and I'm not saying that I ain't going anywhere, but I keep my safety system so tight that uh, my butt's just barely touching the seat when I'm sitting in my seat because if I fall, I'm just going to get back in my seat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I ain't putting on that slippage stuff. I ain't going toward the ground. I, I ran some of the cheaper the cheaper systems and, you know, they, they they did their job, but I do feel more secure with the vest type setup. Yeah, I know. And just make sure they got some wide straps, the straps that go between your legs and stuff, no matter which company. Uh, make sure it's got wide straps because those thin can you imagine falling out of a stand and being caught by those inch and a half or inch and a quarter straps? They're, they'll cut you from A to Z. It, it wouldn't feel good. But uh, but it would save you. That's the whole thing to that thing. But uh, always remember, uh, somebody's building these. So I don't care who's building them. Make sure you check it out. Make sure you check every stitch on that whole vest. Uh, that, uh, that whole row. Make sure when you go back in your stand, check for squirrels chewing on them. Make sure you check your lifeline because all that stuff can happen. It, it ain't going to happen 95% of the time. But when it does happen, it's going to cost you. So just make sure everything is checked out and everything is strong. I took one vest uh, of a company, and I'm not even going to mention I wouldn't down anybody, but I took it with my hands and wrapped it up and pulled it I had to pull it pretty hard and broke it. Broke it. And uh the uh and I go, My goodness, what would what would happen? But inspect it no matter who it is, no matter if it's hunter safety system, no matter whose it is, uh inspect every stitch on it before you carry it to the woods. And uh but uh you know, and if they're doing it right, it's it, they got it overkill. If there's anything you want overkill, you want it that. And and what I tell people too, and I know I'm keep like I'm selling hunter safety system, uh, and I and I do I love them. I do great company, great people, and everything else. But uh, before they like I say before they was uh, I work with them, they were sponsors to us, and before that friends. So um, one thing you say about them, they're always on top of that stuff um, of building safe of building safe product. So. You can trust them on that part. You don't. You don't want to go down here to Walmart and to buy you a parachute. Right? <laughs> <laughs> That's just the way it is. I like Walmart. Yeah. But you want to go down and get a no parachute? Yeah, I don't think I would trust a parachute from Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. That's that, uh, that's always the point I use. I said you just don't do it. Well. Jesse, I appreciate you taking the time out of your day to record this with me. Is there anybody that you need to plug or uh, anything that you want to bring up to end this here podcast? No, I just uh, basically, you know, I'm I'm real simple now. I'm just a uh, real a real tree Matthew Hunter Safety System kind of guy, and, uh, and the reason they they've always been so loyal to me, and Carbon Express, and people I could name a bunch of them, but those. Main ones there just uh, has always been part of us, so we always close. David Langston from Real Tree just left out here a while ago, and that's part of part of my family. And and Hoss must like it pretty doggone good to have a Real Tree tattoo on his arm that big. I thought that's pretty impressive. <laughs> that, that's very true. He does have a big old tattoo on his arm of Real Tree. <laughs> <laughs> well, but uh, yeah, they're all good people. I can vouch for all of them. They're awesome people. So, what do you think about that podcast? Some awesome stories from a legend in the outdoor industry. I hope you guys enjoyed this week's episode of the Devoted Outdoorsman's Podcast. And stay tuned, because as fall gets here, 
only more podcasts and more great content will be released. So I hope you guys have a great week and stay tuned for the next episode of the Devoted Outdoorsman's Podcast.